Yes, hello once again. Welcome back to Class Inc. Dirt Bike TV, the home of uh, old school uh, vintage uh, scrambles bikes. And uh, coming up in this next uh, featured uh, video, we're going to take a look at a quite uh, rare uh, bike. Then this uh, particular uh, machine is part of the Terry Pickering Classic Motorcycle uh, Collection. And this uh, featured bike is just one of only two uh, prototypes that were built back in the early 1980s. So uh, let's uh, jump straight into that video and take a look at this uh, 1980s uh, AJS uh, 440 motocrosser. Okay, so this uh, rather uh, unusual uh, looking machine that we're going to take a, a look at is the first in a series of uh, older classics that we're going to be featuring from the Terry Pickering motorcycle uh, collection and uh, if you're a subscriber or even just a follower of my youtube channel in the past then you may have already uh, seen quite a few of the amazing two wheelers that terry has in his aladdin's cave of old uh, dirt bike uh, memorabilia now if you're a regular uh, subscriber uh, to cdb uh, tv then you may uh, already know that uh, terry has this uh, huge assortment of classic uh, dirt bikes and uh, road bikes and even classic cars in his uh, workshop to keep him uh, occupied now he also has a massive uh, warehouse of old uh, bikes and parts all uh, awaiting their turn uh, to be brought uh, back to life and currently uh, Terry has this uh, quite rare British designed and built uh, 1980 uh, Wilcomoto uh, 500 Enduro bike which he tells me he's almost uh, finished apart from just a few uh, smaller uh, items like uh, grips and uh, a lighting switch before he can uh, then add uh, this uh, quite rare machine to his bike uh, collection. But when you take a look at uh, exactly what this bike looked like uh, prior to its restoration, you can see that uh, Terry, he doesn't exactly refurbish bikes uh, lightly, but uh, when he does tackle a particular project, you can rest assured that it's all uh, put back to almost as new uh, condition. But this quite rare uh, Wilcomoto is uh, yet another project that we hope to be featuring uh, from Terry's collection in a forthcoming video here on uh, my YouTube uh, channel. So uh, look out uh, for that because Terry does have some uh, motorcycle gems in his assortment of old bikes. But uh, anyhow, let's get down to our uh, featured bike, which uh, at first glance you uh, might be forgiven for uh, thinking that uh, this bike here looks like it's maybe something that uh, somebody's made up uh, using uh, all of their odd spare parts that they've had lying around their garage or workshop. And to be fair, the bike is uh, a bit of a concoction of uh, various different uh, manufacturers' components all uh, cobbled together to form uh, what is in essence uh, a quite decent uh, looking motorcycle. So with regards to the actual background of this bike, uh, very little is uh, known about the machine and even less, I think, has been documented about its design uh, or construction. Although uh, we do know that the bike uh, was built around uh, the early uh, 1980s and it was just one of only two uh, prototypes uh, that were put uh, together. And just before Terry uh, refurbished the bike, he made a quick phone call uh, to Nick Brown, who is, of course, the son of the late uh, Fluff Brown, who, as you're aware, uh, bought out uh, all of the bikes and the spare parts of the old AJS Stormer uh, scramblers in the early uh, 1970s. But Nick uh, certainly did confirm that this bike was indeed uh, one of two prototypes that were built in the early 1980s with a view to uh, possibly uh, resurrecting the old AJS uh, motocrosser's name uh, of the past. And uh, after uh, a brief introduction on the track, it was uh, some time later that this uh, project was then uh, shelved and uh, both of the AJS 
uh, project bikes were sold and then subsequently acquired uh, by Terry. But Nick Brown certainly did confirm to Terry that he did uh, ride this uh, bike uh, competitively a few times and uh, although his initial impressions uh, were quite good with regards to uh, the bike's power and handling, uh, as uh, with all of these new bike build projects, he admitted that uh, further development uh, was required uh, to improve its performance. But as to uh, who actually built uh, the two prototypes initially in the 1980s is uh, unknown, although I expect that uh, Nick Brown uh, did have some part to play in the project because he did uh, ride the bike at it as its uh, test pilot, but uh, as this was essentially just an experimental machine, it was never ever uh, adorned with any kind of graphics or badges of any kind because it was uh, never ever decided at that time if the bike uh, would progress any further than uh, just being a motorcycle uh, experiment. So as we uh, get into some of the nitty gritty of uh, some of the bike's uh, components, beginning of course with this uh, steel uh, chassis, which I can only assume uh, was an AGIS uh, designed frame because uh, AGIS uh, weren't of course going to use uh, one of their uh, own engines uh, to power this bike, but instead they decided on using an Austrian made uh, Rotax uh, two-stroke. But you can see that the steel frame certainly looks to be well constructed and is uh, basically a tubular uh, type frame that's uh, obviously been uh, designed uh, to slot in that Rotax uh, 440 uh, power plant. Well, here at the back of the bike, it's uh, a pretty simple uh, box section uh, steel uh, swing arm to accommodate uh, what, of course, is a, a single monoshock uh, rear uh, suspension unit. But I can understand just uh, why the construction of the bike chassis and uh, this swing arm has been kept uh, reasonably simple and uh, unfussy because uh, this bike, as I said, uh, was just an experimental prototype. So I suppose it was uh, probably best to start out with uh, something uh, simple and uh, make uh, subtle changes as the machine uh, was tested and further uh, developed. But looking at the bike here, just sitting uh, on this bike stand, it certainly uh, has the look of a machine that uh, had uh, potential, but uh, the reality was that uh, the bike, uh, like many other uh, prototypes, uh, maybe never had uh, the investment or the time uh, to put their ideas uh, to fruition, which is uh, often the case with good ideas and projects uh, such as these. So when it came to choosing a decent power plant for this new AGIS uh, competition machine, the old engines that uh, Nick's dad uh, used in the 1970s Stormer Scramblers were certainly uh, available, but of course those were uh, old uh, technology for a 1980s motocrosser, so uh, something uh, a bit better, more powerful and reliable had to be found and uh, so the bike's builders decided on this Austrian-made uh, Rotax uh, 440 uh, two-stroke, an engine that was certainly used to power many of the old uh, Can-Am bikes of the late 1970s and early 80s, but uh, there were also uh, a host of other uh, European bike builders who made good use of these engines, including uh, the likes of Butch and uh, Kramer and uh, SWM that are just a few that spring uh, to mind. And even the British-built cotton EMXs uh, use these uh, Rotaxes uh, to good effect. So you couldn't have picked uh, a better engine uh, to power a new prototype uh, motocrosser because these uh, 400 two-stroke uh, Rotaxes are well uh, proven uh, power plants. Uh, they did develop quite good power and most important of all, uh, these engines uh, were super reliable. So in that respect, uh, this motor ticks uh, all of the important boxes you'd require for uh, a successful uh, race bike. 
Now, most of these uh, Rotax engines did have uh, quite a sizable uh, surface area for the combined uh, cylinder and uh, head, which uh, was, I think, all designed just to try and help uh, the overall cooling uh, of the engine and dissipate that heat that was generated uh, a bit more efficiently. And as I remember, this uh, 400 or 440 engine I think had a bore of about 84 uh, millimetres and a stroke uh, of what I think was about 72 uh, millimetres. So in terms of uh, horsepower developed at the rear wheel, uh, this was said to be in and around the uh, 40 odd uh, horsepower uh, mark. Now with regards to the fueling of these uh, 400s, now in the past these uh, Rotaxes often had McCuney carburetors uh, bolted onto them but uh, although our engine here has fed its gas through a big uh, 54 uh, Bing uh, carburetor which uh, goes through uh, a case uh, reed valve intake which of course made the power delivery of this engine uh, very smooth uh, right through its entire uh, rev range and with regards its air supply it was usually uh, a washable uh, foam type air filter that was inside uh, this plastic air box and uh, access uh, to that filter was just a simple case of removing the bike seat where you could then uh, remove the filter and clean it and uh, refit it. And uh, here on the engine's ignition side it was a relatively uh, modern style CDI uh, Bosch ignition uh, system which again uh, was super efficient and very uh, reliable as you'd expect from uh, a fully integrated uh, spark uh, system which is uh, of course a massive step forward from those uh, older uh, contact breaker ignitions that we used to have uh, in the past. And here on the engine's transmission side we have your uh, stock uh, oil cooled uh, wet multi-plate clutch which uh, as I remember I think had seven plates inside it with a combination of uh, steel and uh, cork uh, based driven plates. Now the gearbox part of the engine was a, a five speeder constant mesh affair so uh, there were uh, plenty cogs in there to keep your left foot busy uh, knocking up and down uh, the shifter to keep the 440 engine uh, buzzing along. But some of the other parts fitted onto this Rotax engine was uh, this exhaust uh, system which was an experimental uh, prototype so uh, no uh, stock standard or original part uh, was available to make uh, the engine's exhaust expansion chamber so this part here had to be custom made uh, to fit uh, neatly around uh, the bike's frame and of course that chosen uh, Rotax Engine. Now, as opposed to who actually uh, made this part, I was never uh, told on the day that I shot these clips. And uh, the pipe itself, uh, as you can see, doesn't have any uh, maker's mark. So that's uh, yet more evidence that this has been uh, a one-off uh, construction. Which is probably uh, the same scenario here with this uh, alloy tailpipe here at the back that uh, certainly doesn't look like it's any particular uh, manufacturer's uh, part but uh, most probably uh, this again has been borrowed uh, from another uh, machine and uh, has been put to good use on this uh, project bike but it still appears to fit in with the rest of the aesthetics uh, of our AGIS uh, creation and it uh, has of course a removable uh, baffle there so that it can be uh, cleaned and then repacked with new uh, exhaust uh, padding. So again, another uh, bespoke uh, part uh, fitted to our AGIS. But moving on to the front end uh, of our prototype uh, off-roader. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this bike uh, has been uh, put together using a variation of different uh, motorcycle parts from other bikes and uh, it's a pair of Yamaha uh, YZ uh, front forks and hubs that have been put to good use 
uh, on our experimental uh, machine. Now, as to uh, what model or year of Yamaha forks, uh, I don't uh, actually know, but they do look like these could maybe be from uh, maybe a 465 or possibly even uh, the bigger uh, 490. And in terms of the hubs and the brakes, uh, these are uh, also uh, YZ uh, Yamaha parts. So at least when it comes to a pair of decent hubs and brakes, these uh, Yamaha uh, components uh, will do the job uh, very nicely. And if you're uh, familiar with these uh, YZ forks, hubs and brakes, then you'll already know that uh, they're uh, quite a good combination and uh, work uh, very well together, considering that these are still uh, the old school uh, drum brake systems and not uh, some of the newer hydraulic disc and caliper affairs that uh, we enjoy on our bikes uh, today. But this uh, front hub it certainly looks like it could be a twin uh, leading shoe uh, stopping uh, system. And as you'd expect, it's uh, a similar uh, setup here uh, at the back of the bike with the Yamaha YZ hub uh, bolted uh, onto the bike's steel box section uh, swing arm. Oh, and just in case you're even interested, it's uh, also uh, a quite nice pair of alloy uh, Akrant wheels that are fitted uh, onto the front and the back uh, of this bike. And to transmit that uh, reputed uh, 40 horsepower from the Rotax engine onto the back wheel, it's a quite sizable uh, rear drive sprocket here that's uh, fixed onto the Yamaha hub there by, uh, I think it's at least 10 uh, little uh, Allen bolt uh, screws. So uh, this alloy sprocket certainly got a lot to do to put that Rotax power onto uh, that uh, rear wheel. But here in the bike's uh, rear suspension area, you can see that it's uh, a single uh, monoshock type setup, which is what you'd expect on a later uh, motocross uh, machine with this uh, quite heavy duty shock and uh, spring with its uh, remote uh, gas an oil uh, filled uh, canister which is uh, situated uh, on the outside of the bike into the airflow where it can be uh, cooled if that uh, back shock's uh, being worked uh, quite hard. But again, and uh, as per much of the other parts on this bike, uh, no identifying manufacturers' uh, logos or uh, graphics, but uh, this shock here uh, does have the look that uh, it might be uh, one of those uh, white power uh, suspension uh, units. And uh, here at the bottom end of that suspension shock, it's uh, connected to a kind of uh, floating uh, linkage type uh, setup, uh, not unlike many of the top uh, Japanese race bikes uh, of their day, although uh, as to exactly how well this uh, rear shock linkage and swing arm actually all work together, uh, I don't uh, know, but it certainly looks like it's been uh, well thought through and uh, put together. Now, to store all of the premix fuel for our new project bike, uh, naturally, uh, a tank had to be found that would fit straight uh, onto the prototype uh, steel chassis, and uh, with that in mind, it also had to be one that was made of plastic just to try and keep the overall weight of the bike uh, to a minimum and uh, of course hold enough gas to feed that thirsty uh, Rotax engine on even the longest of motocross uh, races. Plus it had to be a tank that was quite easily available off the shelf so it was a bit of a no-brainer that this uh, Michael uh, fuel tank uh, was then uh, chosen. Now, I'm in guessing mode here again, and I'm pretty sure that this uh, tank here has been uh, borrowed from uh, either a 1980 or maybe even a 1981 uh, Michael, because uh, as you're aware, Michael did change uh, from the older alloy tanks on the 79 bike to these uh, plastic ones on the 1980 uh, models. But I must say this uh, Michael tank here does look the part on this prototype machine and uh, again you can see uh, no graphics or other badges 
to identify it. And moving on to the seat on our new race bike, and once again, you, you can see that it looks like it's got the, the right profile and padding to enable it to give its rider the correct amount of comfort required. And once more, this seat looks suspiciously like it could be another old Michael part, although naturally that seat cover there has been swapped just to fit in with the rest of the white and red theme of this bike. But if it's as good and comfortable as my old Michael seat was back in the day, then this will be another quality part that's been bolted onto a rare AGIS Rotax. And as we get uh, onto the bike's uh, plastics now with these uh, side panels in particular, which believe it or not are actually uh, AGIS parts that were uh, used on, uh, or at the very least uh, destined uh, to be used on future uh, bike models by the late uh, Fluff Brown. But uh, as you can see, these have now been uh, utilised as body panels on our new uh, featured uh, prototype. Although at first glance I'm uh, almost 100% uh, sure that these uh, would have been uh, originally moulded to fit some of the older uh, twin shot bikes that uh, Fluff Brown uh, was building at the time because they had these uh, slots uh, down either side which I'm guessing is uh, to accommodate uh, a shock on either side uh, of the bike's uh, swing arm. And moving on to some of the other plastics uh, on our bike, like this uh, front uh, and the rear uh, mudguards, which are uh, more or less uh, off-the-shelf uh, regular uh, reproduction uh, motocross items that are quite easily sourced uh, from any uh, kind of reputable uh, motocross or uh, off-road uh, parts supplier. And again, uh, these plastics uh, fit in perfectly uh, with that red uh, livery theme uh, of the bike's uh, chassis and uh, fuel tank seat and of course the red gaiters that are fitted onto those Yamaha uh, front uh, forks. But for me it makes uh, sense not to spend uh, too much money on top of the range uh, parts when you're developing a brand new prototype because I think it's much more important uh, to get the essential things right uh, first uh, like the chassis handling and the bike's uh, suspension. And uh, finally, as we move up into the uh, rider's uh, seat of our experimental uh, two-wheeler, now uh, these handlebars are uh, definitely uh, old school items because uh, back in the day when uh, bike manufacturers made handlebars uh, for their race machines, the strengthening uh, crossbar was uh, more or less uh, always welded on rather than uh, with the likes of our uh, modern day handlebars that fit the crossbar with uh, simple clamps. And again you can see here that the clutch and the front brake uh, levers are uh, quite good quality items, possibly uh, Magura uh, parts and uh, the other uh, little add-ons like uh, control cables and uh, grips are uh, more or less uh, brand new parts that you can easily pick up uh, online or maybe at any uh, good quality motocross uh, motorcycle bike store. And it's this uh, Magura alloy gasser throttle twist grip that's the part that has the responsibility of controlling the uh, 40 or so horsepower that uh, the Austrian Rotax two-stroke engine was uh, said to pump out uh, to the bike's uh, rear wheel. So from past uh, personal experiences with these Rotax engines, it's uh, a good, steady, uh, conservative hand that's required on this gasser to keep uh, this motorcycle uh, on the straight and narrow. So, uh, as I said, with uh, all things uh, considered, this is uh, still a bike that uh, appeared to have had uh, quite a lot of potential if it had been uh, developed a bit further, because on the face of it, 
it certainly uh, had the look of a bike that could have been uh, a contender, although uh, as to the reasons why it wasn't followed through to its eventual uh, completion is anybody's uh, guess, but I expect it was uh, something to do with uh, lack of investment or maybe some other uh, money-oriented uh, venture. But again, it's thanks to Terry Pickering who's uh, saved uh, what was left of both bikes and then refurbished uh, all of the parts and uh, put uh, both of the bikes back uh, together so that he could then uh, add them uh, to his uh, collection and continue uh, building up uh, one of the best assortments of old school scramblers in uh, the UK, a title that Terry uh, almost certainly uh, deserves. But coming up next here on CDB uh, TV, we continue to make our way through Terry's fantastic compendium of old uh, motorcycle classics. And next up, we're going to take a look at this uh, superb MX250 Yamaha from uh, the 19. Uh, 70s. So if these are the kind of bikes that you like to look at on YouTube, then maybe you'll consider subscribing uh, to my channel or just simply return at a later date to check out this uh, super uh, classic uh, bike. So again, thanks once more for taking the time to view my content and I do hope you enjoyed taking a trip around that rare British built uh, EJS. So uh, until the next time, it's uh, thanks for watching and it's goodbye for now.